Take your Bible this evening, if you would, please, to Luke chapter 7. Please turn to Luke chapter 7 for our scripture reading this evening. We're going to read the first 10 verses of Luke chapter 7, and we'll read them responsively, beginning together on verse 1, then I'll read verse 2, and we'll alternate <coughs> until we read through verse number 10. Luke chapter 7. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture tonight. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. And let's begin together on verse 1 of Luke chapter 7. Ready? Now when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion's servant, who was dear unto him, was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus... He sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also a man am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come. And he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And let's read 10 together also. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this evening. We thank you, Lord, again for the Bible and for allowing us to have copies of your word in our hands tonight. And Lord, we're asking you that you would continue to make our hearts ready to receive the truth from your word this evening. And that, Lord, as we listen tonight, we would not just listen to uh, learn and not just listen to be entertained or to gain knowledge, but that we would listen, that we might obey, that we would desire to be doers of the word, not hearers only. So Lord, I pray that you'll bless the special as it's sung now, and it'll minister to our hearts and it'll put our heart in tune with yours, that we'll have ears to hear what the Spirit would say to each of us this evening. It's in Jesus' name we ask it, amen. strong and pure and good and her leaders on their knees were not ashamed to call on God but our nation in her pride has turned her back upon the right and the clouds of evil threaten to turn glory into night strong wickedness has crept in like a cold and bloody thief those who know the Stand by in disbelief For the love of God and country We must not cease for a day For the future of our children We must lift our hearts and pray Turn the tide, Lord, turn the tide Open wide the floodgates of your power Stem the flood Enemy is hard 
hard at work undermining everywhere breaking down foundations twisting laws and setting snares he would take away our freedom and replace it with despair and he laughs at those opposing him as if it were not there but god's children cannot sit by we must stand up and defend for the battle is not over till our lord declares an end we must work and fight and meet him not as those who beat the air for the greatest weapon in our hands is strong and fervent prayer turn the tide or turn the tide open wide the floodgates of your power stem the flood of wickedness restore me It seems that all ungodliness is knocking at our door. We must never give up hope. We must not let them win the war. We must plead with them who has the power to cleanse and to restore. Turn the tide, Lord, turn the tide. Open wide the floodgates of your power. Stem the blood of wickedness, restore, revive, and bless. Turn the tide. Now, Father in heaven, we bow before you as we open up your word tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity again for us to look into your word. And Lord, I I realize it's warm this evening in here, and it's not easy for folks to, to stay awake and to listen. I pray you'd help us tonight to focus, and Lord, help me to say what you want me to say and to leave unsaid what doesn't need to be said. But I pray, Lord, we would get some things tonight uh, from this account of the centurion and his servant being healed that would help each one of us to receive what we need from you. And may the characteristics of this man be seen in each of our lives that you might be pleased with us as well. So help us tonight and give us all the ability to listen carefully and hear what you would want to say to us this evening. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, the poor air conditioner is doing the best it can. <laughs> it's uh, very warm out, as most of you know, and uh, probably about a 90, 90 some degrees and a over 90% chance of deodorant failure. So um, <laughs> if you need to move a seat away from somebody, feel free to do so, but I hope we can be a, a help to you tonight. And the story, Luke 7, if your Bible's open there, is... The story of a centurion who had a servant that was sick and ready to die. He heard of Jesus. You know, that's a great statement. Verse number three, when he heard of Jesus. Isn't that great? Somebody was talking about Jesus. And he heard about it. You never know who's listening when you talk about Jesus. So talk about Jesus, all right? And uh, he heard about Jesus, and that's a... You'll find that phrase occasionally through the Gospels. And he sends some elders of the Jews to where Jesus is, asking him for one thing, that he'd heal his sick servant. The elders beg Jesus, they beseech him, they ask him, and Jesus agrees that he will come and heal this man's servant. However, as he's going there, he gets close to where the man lives, and he sends some friends of his out to stop the entourage that Jesus is in. And he tells him, I'm not worthy to have you come into my home. Just say the word and my servant can be healed. He said, I understand authority and I understand that if 
Uh, I, I tell somebody to do something, they'll do it. And if you just say the word, my servant will be healed. And it's interesting. You notice what verse number 9 says? When Jesus heard these things, He, what? Marveled at Him. Now, I understand marveling at Jesus. I understand being amazed at God. But this is one of those rare times where Jesus marveled at man. And marveled at a man. And He marveled at this centurion. He said, I've not seen so great faith, no, not in all Israel. This is a Roman. This is an Italian. This is not a Jew. And he has great faith in me. I think this centurion made straight A's. And Jesus rewarded him for that. Now, I'm going to talk about the four A's that the centurion had. There are four characteristics that he possessed that each of us can possess. Now, I asked this morning how many of you ever got straight A's on your report card. Don't raise your hand. I don't want to know you. If you did. But these, and, and by the way, some are not able, don't have the capability to get all A's. Understand that. But in this area, we all can have these A's. Okay? This is straight A's that all of us have the opportunity to attain. There are four of them. The four A's that Jesus rewarded in the life of this centurion. The first A is the word affections. Affections. Here's a centurion that I'm sure had a love for his homeland. His affection would be for Italy. He was a Roman soldier after all. But he also loved the people who, was, who were around him. In this case, he had a great affection for one of his servants, a slave who worked for him. And he had become attached to this fellow. Now, I understand, slaves would be there for their life. There was no leaving. So it would not be unusual to become attached to that person. Uh, if they were of similar age, they could almost become like brothers. If they were younger, he might treat them almost as like a son. But the centurion, in any event, loved this servant. And he didn't want him to die. I gather from the story, it doesn't give the man's age, but I assume he's not an old man. I assume he's young enough. The centurion didn't think it was his time to die yet. And so he wanted Jesus to be able to heal him. But for the centurion to be concerned, you understand, if a, it, would have been not, it would not have been against the law for the centurion if a slave got sick and was unable to perform his duties, was unable to work anymore, it was not against the law for that centurion to have the slave put to death. He's of no use to me anymore. He was, it was, after all, they were just property. That's the way it was. But he didn't do that. He had an affection for him. And that says not, not so much about the slave as it does the centurion. His character and his affection that he had for those who did service for him. You know, you can tell a lot about somebody by how they treat people that are underneath them. Don't, don't uh, show me how somebody... You're not going to learn much by how somebody treats the CEO of the company or the president of the company. Show me how they treat the custodian who cleans the building. Show me, show me how you treat the waiter or the waitress at the restaurant. Show me how you treat those who... I was reading in, in, in preparing the message there, and I didn't write this down, but it, it came to my mind right now that a fellow was in college and he took a, uh, came in for a test and they had these questions. It was a quiz, actually, and he said, I think there were like ten questions, and he kind of breezed through them until he came to the last question. And the last question was, what is the name of the woman 
who cleans the school building. Whoa. And he said he stopped him right there. He said, I've seen her dozens of times. Walk right past. Never decided, never needed, never thought about asking her name, who she is. And one of the, when the papers were passed in, one of the students said, uh, do you, is that question really going to count? And the professor said, it absolutely will count. Because how you treat those who you feel are lesser than you determines a lot about your character. And he shared the name with those men. You see, how do you treat folks? Do you have concern for them? Do you have affection for them? Do you understand their people who are struggling and their people who are trying to do a job too? That they're people just like you and me? Amen? You know, it's one thing I, I had occasion <clears throat> sometimes in ministry in different times throughout ministry there's times we've worked jobs uh, my wife and I to help make ends meet. And for a while one time in ministry <clears throat> I, I did some custodial work cleaning the YWCA. You know, it's amazing. I, had, I saw firsthand how different people treat you when you're pastor slave off and how different they treat you when you're janitor slave off. It's a big difference. And, and it's sad. Y'all treat everybody the same. All the ground, listen, the ground at the cross is all level. Okay? Uh, nobody has to be treated different than anyone else. But he had a great affection for his servant. He had a great affection for his community. The, this servant had a... <clears throat> notice what the elders said when they went to Jesus, the elders of the Jews. Verse number 4, it says, They came to Jesus and besought Him instantly, saying that He was worthy for whom He should do this. For He loveth our nation, and He hath built us a synagogue. He said, I, I, he says, He loves our nation, Jesus. You're, you're a Jew. He loves us. You know how we know He loves us? He built us a synagogue. Now, soldiers were paid well. And the higher up you went as a soldier, you were paid even better. So this man had some means. <clears throat> and he built them a synagogue. Now, uh, there was... So there had to be some kind of a draw from, for this Roman to the Jewish religion. Maybe it was just the morality of it. Most of the... Obviously, the Romans would be very immoral. If they did have religion, it even involved immorality anyway. Idol worship. So maybe he was drawn to their morality. Maybe he knew there's something not right with what we're doing, with what my country believes or my people believe, but I sure admire what these folks do. And he had a real affection for his community, and he gave money so they could build a synagogue. Do you think that really helped a Roman centurion's career to build the Jews a synagogue? I'm sure that he took some grief for that. But you understand. I understand what his affection was. The Bible says that we are citizens of another country. If you're here tonight and you are a Christian, you have been born again by the Spirit of God, you, are, you have a dual citizenship. Your citizenship is in heaven, the Bible says, according to Philippians 3.20, and our citizenship is in the United States of America. But you understand, my first loyalty and my first love is for my citizenship in heaven. That's my first loyalty. Don't, don't equate, and, 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 and I struggle sometimes in this day with the position and the direction our country has taken. See, there was, a day, there was a day when we almost equated being patriotic with being spiritual. We have to be careful about that. Because there come a time when 
when our stand for God will be in great conflict with being loyal to our country. Our country is going further and further from God. We have to make sure that we're not, we're not torn in our allegiance. There's no tear there. My allegiance is to God. My allegiance is to His Word. That's where my citizenship is. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So we have to make sure that our, we're first citizens of the kingdom of heaven and then of the United States. It doesn't mean we're not looking out, as we spoke this morning, it doesn't mean we're not looking out for those around us. And we, we do what we talked about this morning in order to help our country, in order to influence our country for God. We're going to pray. And we're going to live righteously. And we are going to witness fervently and, and faithfully to people and try to get them the gospel. That's how we'll make a lasting difference in our nation. So I see the first day is his affections. What's the first day? Affections. First day is what? Affections. Okay, let's go to the second day. So far you got one, okay? You're one for one. Now the second one is ashamed. Ashamed. Obviously the centurion, when he heard about Jesus, was very impressed. He knew Jesus could heal his servant. I don't know what he heard. It doesn't say what he heard. But I'm sure he heard about miracles. I'm sure he heard about people being healed. I'm sure he heard things that Jesus had done. Now, uh, he knew Jesus had to be, whether he knew he was the Son of God or not, we don't know. Whether he believed in him as, as the, the God in the flesh, we don't know. But he did know he could do the miraculous. You understand, he knew also that Jewish people don't hang around Gentiles. He was aware of that. You remember... Uh, the Jewish people called Gentiles dogs. There wasn't a real affection there, okay? So what does he do? He sends some Jews to go ask Jesus. He doesn't even think that he ought to go talk to him. And of course, they go and talk to him. And the elders said, it's interesting, the elders say, he is worthy for whom we should do this. They're giving the merits to Jesus. And, and if anybody, if any Gentile would have been deserving to go into Jesus and have an audience with him, it probably would have been the centurion. But they certainly said he was worthy. But yet when he gets close and Jesus is almost to his home, he sends out some friends to say, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. He says, no, I'd, I'd be ashamed to have you come into my house. I'm not worthy to have you come in here. Well, wait a minute. They said he was worthy. How come they thought he was worthy? Because he knew not just the outside. He knew what was inside. He knew what he really was. He knew that he didn't deserve to have Jesus come to him. I think he was ashamed of himself. I think maybe he knew what Paul knew in Romans 7 when Paul said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. I'm not worthy. Maybe he knew what Isaiah said when Isaiah said, all my righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of God. Many, many can get an inflated view of themselves. And it's all right if other people say, man, you're a good person. Man, you're really worthy. Boy, you sure are a good Christian. But you better not think that. You better recognize the truth. Any, listen, any sin... You can read about in the New Testament any wicked sin of the flesh. That is in your heart and in my heart. And we are capable of that. There is none righteous, no, not one. 
Robert E. Lee was told that he was being prayed for by all the chaplains. At that time, tears came to General Lee's eyes as he said, Please thank them for that, sir. I warmly appreciate it. And I can only say that I'm nothing but a poor sinner trusting in Christ alone for salvation and I need all the prayers that they can offer me. What was the Jews' problem? The Jews thought they were too good to come to Christ. The problem with most people is not that they think they're too bad to be saved, but they think they're too good to be saved. Saved? What do I need to be saved for? You see? I'm, I'm a good person. And sometimes, sometimes we use that expression and we have to be careful. Because there's none that doeth good. No, not one. The only good thing about you, the only good thing about me, is Jesus Christ. If it weren't for Him, there'd be nothing good about us. You see, the very first thing, the very first thing you have to admit and agree with God about before you can ever come to Christ is, I am a sinner and I need a Savior. I can't save myself. I can't do anything to get rid of my sin. You have to admit that and agree with God about that. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So the first day is affection. The second day is ashamed. The first day is what? Affection. The second day is ashamed. You're two for two. You're on your way to straight A's. Number three, the third A I see here is authority. Authority. You know, without a respected line of authority, chaos develops. You, You can't have a large group of individuals, such as an army. Some of you served in the different branches of the military. And they they cannot function with that large of a group unless there's a chain of command. It has to be there. If, 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 If you have that, you have united and coordinated forces. Without that, you have every man for himself. Military people understand authority. Soldiers are taught to submit to authority immediately. And, and by the way, whether they're training to be officers or not. I remember, oh, this goes back over 30 years. I don't know if they still do this or not because I think our, our military has been softened up quite a bit by our culture. But I remember a fella who was in the mid-80s, so we're going back over 30-some years. I was only 12, but... Um, not really, I was 14. But um, we, I remember a couple left our church. They, they joined the army. Joined the army, Brother Yoder. And I remember him getting a letter <clears throat> back. And he said, literally, he said, they're having me clean the little tiles in the bathroom with a toothbrush. He said, what is that about? It's about him Learning to obey orders and submit to authority. When you're, when you're in the midst of a battle, when you're in the heat of a battle, and seconds can mean life or death, you better learn to obey immediately. When you're, when you're, when you're training your children and they're in the yard and and they begin to run after the ball that is rolled into the street and you see them running towards the street in a car coming down the road and you yell, stop! You better hope they don't say, what? What are you talking about? You better hope they've learned to obey right away. Boom. Stop. It's life or death. It's life or death. Authority. And mom and dad, would you remember... You're the authority at home. Children are to obey their parents. Give them something to obey. Okay? That means 
you call the shots, they don't call the shots. You know, the four-year-old doesn't run the house, the two-year-old doesn't run the house. That's another sermon, I better not get chasing that one. But when you question authority, you balk at commands. For a soldier, it can result in your own death and the death of your fellow soldiers. So the military teaches both how to submit to authority and how to exercise authority. And that's really what the centurion said, didn't he? Notice what he said in verse 8. He said, I'm a man set under authority. He said, so I, I, I have guys over me who tell me what to do and I do what they say. But, he said, I have under me soldiers, and I say unto one, go, and he goeth, to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. So he says, I understand how to submit to authority, and I understand how to exercise authority. Centurion had a hundred men under him, in charge of a hundred men. And though he is able, think about this, as a Roman soldier and as the Jews being underneath the Romans, he had the ability to command Jesus come to him. He's the one in authority. But he submits to Jesus' authority. He called him Lord. And that's not Lord as in God, but Lord as in Sir. It's much like Saul on the road to Damascus when he first had the light and knocked him off his, that, that shined above the, bright, the light of the sun and it knocked him off the animal he's riding on. And, and he said, why persecute? He heard the voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? He's saying, who are you, sir? I mean, if you can, if you can knock me off my horse and this, this thing shines brighter than the sun and I'm laying here on the ground and I hear your voice, I think I'll call you sir. And, and that's what he did. He said, sir. He called Jesus, sir. In other words, uh, you're the master. You're the boss. You're the commander. I'm here to obey you. I'm here to do whatever you tell me to do. He's saying, I'm underneath you, Jesus. You see, that authority is what our nation believed. When I think, I, I believe it was in, some of you might know this, I think it was under Dwight Eisenhower, and he was president, when was he president? Bob Wallace, were you alive then? You alive? Early 50s? Truman was before him? Yeah. And that's when the Congress put the phrase in our pledge, one nation under God, indivisible. That, that phrase, one nation under God, wasn't in the original Constitution of the United States or anything like that. But we were recognizing we are placing ourselves under the authority of God. That's what that means. When we say we're supposed to be one nation under God. Under God's authority is what that means. We don't, that's why those would have it taken out. Because in reality, they don't want to be under God's authority. We want to keep that in because we desire to be under God's authority. You know, the Bible, the Bible says the Lord is supposed to be the authority in our life. That's why in Romans 10 and verse 9, that, that if we can confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in our heart that God hath raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The Lord Jesus. Lord is, is He's to be the Lord in our life. He's to call the shots in our life. We're no longer in control. He's to be in control. Jesus told His disciples, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All authority is mine. Philippians tells us that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One day, everybody will bow to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. 
You see, here's the problem. So why don't people want... Why, why, do, why do they rebel about God being their authority? Think of that word authority. If you take away the I-T-Y of authority, what's left? Author. Who's the author of it all? God is. He's the author of it all. And I don't want God to be the author of it all. We're here by chance. We're, ha we're here because there was a big bang one day. Things exploded or there was a big, big accident or whatever it may be. But God, the Bible says God's the author of life. The Bible says God is the author of salvation. He's the author and finisher of our faith. From that comes authority. In the first general order to the Continental Army, General George Washington called on, quote, every officer and man to live and act has become a Christian soldier defending the dearest rights and liberties of his country. Wouldn't that be great to have a commander-in-chief to issue that to our soldiers? That you act as but becomes a Christian soldier? Authority. This man understood the authority of Jesus Christ. Who's the authority in your life? Is it still you? You still call the shots? Well, well I, I know the Bible says this, but... Well, I know God says this is wrong, but... All that is a nice way of saying, I'm still going to do what I want. I'm not going to do what God says. Authority. Well, three A's so far. We have number one, affection. Number two, ashamed. Number three, authority. Number one, affection. Number two, ashamed. Number three, authority. All right. You almost have straight A's. Let me give you number four. Assurance. Assurance. This man had great assurance that Jesus could heal his servant. He was under, he put himself under the authority of Jesus so Jesus could do whatever he wanted. He had assurance that if Jesus just said the word, his servant could be healed. That's pretty amazing. Jesus, you don't have to see my servant. You don't have to touch him. You don't even have to be here. Just say the word and he'll be healed. That's pretty incredible. That he would have that kind of faith and that kind of assurance that it would happen. And Jesus marveled at that. Ever, wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be amazing sometime to have enough faith and assurance in God and in Christ that He'd marvel at you? That you'd believe Him and you'd have that much trust and assurance that He's going to take care of the matter? It's obvious at times that, that even when we ask God for something, we ask God to take care of a situation that we really don't have that assurance. Say, so how do you know that? Because when He does it, we're stunned. We're shocked. We're excited. We go to somebody and say, you'll never guess what happened. You won't believe it. God did this, and then we'll tell what God did. And I'm not saying that you would just take the approach, yeah, well, I knew He would. No big deal. No, I think there was quite, I think there probably was quite a party that night at the centurion's house. Celebrating and rejoicing the fact his servant was made whole. Look at your songbook for a minute. Uh, let's see if I can find one up here. Turn over to 506, would you please? 506. 506, if you got the right songbook, is Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. 
Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. How do you have that assurance? You know how you have it? The next two verses start out with the right words. What are, what are they? Perfect submission. Perfect submission. That's always the answer. Perfect submission, perfect delight, perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. Perfect submission. Knowing that Jesus is mine. Knowing that He's available. Knowing the great news is, hey, we don't have to send someone else to Him. We can go to Him. We can approach Him. We can come boldly to the throne of grace and find grace to help in time of need. Concerning the conversion of the Confederate ranks, Chaplain Bennett of General Lee's army wrote this, The whole army is a vast field, ready and ripe to the harvest. The susceptibility of the soldiers to the gospel is wonderful. And doubtful as the remark may appear, the military camp is most favorable to the work of revival. The soldiers, with simplicity of little children, listen to and embrace the truth. Listen, already over 2,000 have professed conversion. And 2,000 more are penitent. Wow. That's, you know, when you read about the deaths in the Civil War, it, it's staggering. That's encouraging that maybe thousands of them knew Christ as their Savior. In an age that's marked by permissiveness, it will help us to have the right attitude regarding authority and submitting to the authority of God. We're in a battle. We're in a battle against Satan. We're in a battle against the enemy is the devil. And if we do not submit to the authority of God, we have no hope. We have no hope of winning. This soldier had assurance and he received exactly what he expected to receive from the Lord Jesus. He said, you speak the word. And Jesus turned around. He didn't say, I'm sure he heard what Jesus said about him, but he didn't hear Jesus say it. The Bible says, as he's going towards the home, he, the, 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 the friends came and said, he just said, you say the word and his servant will be healed. And Jesus turned around to the people following him. And he said, I marvel at this man. I've not seen so great faith, no, not in all Israel. And I wonder if all the Israelites following him hung their head a little bit. That they didn't have that assurance that Jesus could do that for them. Assurance. We, we talk about the Daily Journal in prison quite a bit. In the Daily Journal, the prayer section is broken into four sections. It's prayer, it's praises, well it's praises and it's needs, and below that is forgiveness, and the other one is protection. But after each one of those headings, there's a little word in parentheses. It's called pause. P-A-U-S-E. In other words, when I go to praise God, I should pause first and say, God, what should I praise you for? And then be quiet. And let God tell you what you should praise Him for. But the exciting part is when you go over to the needs, and you say, okay, what needs should I ask God for? Oh, well, that's easy. I got my list right here. I, let's see, I need, I need this, and I need this, and I need this. And 
We begin telling God everything we need. Oh, but we forgot there's that little parentheses word there. Pause. And what transforms the prayer life is when I stop and say, God, what should I ask for? God, what are my needs? Who knows, who knows better what I need, me or God? God does. And when I ask for what God tells me to ask Him for, I'm going to get what I ask for. I have assurance that I ask according to His will. He hears me, and I know if He hears me, I'll have the petitions that I request of Him. But you have to pause. You have to be still. And that gives you the assurance you can receive what you're asking for from God. Straight A's. And the certain centurion got what he asked for. Are you a straight A Christian? What are the four A's? Number one, affection. Number two, ashamed. Number three, number four, assurance. You got all A's. Let's be a straight A Christian. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for everyone's attention tonight. It's been a, a warm evening. And yet, Lord, everyone has listened carefully. And Lord, tonight, these four A's that this centurion had, that you marveled at him and his faith that he had. Lord, I pray that our affection, we would have affection, obviously, for the things of God. But Lord, we would have affection for people. We know the first and greatest commandment is to love you with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength. But the second's like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Boy, this world, our country needs that lesson to be learned. That we would understand what it means to love our neighbor as ourself. Help us to have, a, have an affection for those around us. Help us, God, to understand our own unworthiness. Without you, we are nothing. I can only do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Father, I pray that we'd come under your authority. That truly we would bow our knee to you and say, you are Lord of my life. I will do as you say. And may we operate on the assurance that whatever you say, it will come to pass. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Thank you that we can come to you with our needs and have the assurance that you'll hear us and have the assurance that there is nothing too hard for God. I pray you'll help us all to be straight-A Christians tonight. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish praying here in just a moment. How many believers tonight would say, Preacher, the Lord has spoke to my heart? Maybe one of those A's, maybe several of those A's, that you say, you know, I, I, I need that in my life. I needed the reminder tonight. And the Holy Spirit of God just spoke to my heart this evening. Pastor, pray for me tonight. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Say, pray for me, please. Amen. Amen. You may put them down. In a moment, I'm going to pray, and we'll have your invitation. God has spoken to your heart, respond to Him. Take a moment, bow at the altar. You may just bow and say, Lord, help me to have these characteristics in my life. Maybe there's a special need that you need Jesus to do. You need Him. You need to have the assurance that He's going to do the miracle you need. Now's the time to kneel before Him. Acknowledge your unworthiness. Acknowledge His authority. Have the assurance that He'll do it. Father in heaven, thank You for speaking to our hearts tonight. I pray, Lord, that You'll have Your way now in this invitation. Thank You for including the healing of the centurion's servant and putting it in the Scripture. It's helped us tonight. Have Your way now in this invitation. May each of us obey what you're 
what you have told us to do in our heart. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. The Lord has spoken to your heart. Take a moment and respond to Him tonight. Will you please? Oh, to Jesus I surrender. All oh, to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him. In His presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All oh, to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All oh, to Jesus, I surrender Humbly at his feet I bow, worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender all. Oh, to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessings fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Father, we thank You for this evening and thank You, Lord, for the wonderful privilege to be Your children. Thank You for loving us. Thank You for saving us. Thank you for so loving us that you'd send your only begotten son to die on the cross for our sin. And Lord, we thank you for our country. Lord, we're not pleased with the direction America has gone. But Lord, we're asking you to help us to make a difference in this world in which we live, in this country in which we live. That us and many like us across this land would rise up we would pray, we would live godly, righteously, and we would witness faithfully. We would let people know the freedom that's available in Jesus Christ. Help us to have these four A's in our life. that We could impact our country for you once again. Keep us faithful to you until you return for us, Lord. We're looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you tarry your coming, give us a good week. Make us mindful that you're with us as we leave this place tonight. Bring us back safely, Lord, for the midweek service on Wednesday. And we'll thank you for it. I pray these things today in Jesus' name. Amen.